Let's talk about the sequence of domesticated small seeded plants in eastern North America. Sometimes I call this the myth of the three sisters. So far, the earliest domesticated crop found in eastern North America is the bottle gourd. Guess where the earliest gourd was found? At the Windover Mortuary Pond in northeastern Florida, where preservation was incredible because of the um, acidic bog uh, with anaerobic environments. What makes this also especially incredible is that the bottle gourd is not native to eastern North America. It's from western Africa. So we have no wild gourds here, and uh, the gourd itself must have floated from Africa across the ocean and landed on the coast of Florida, where the local Indians picked it up and planted the seeds. How did it get to Florida? Experimental archaeology uh, looked into whether bottle gourds, one, could float in water long enough, uh, well, number one, whether there were any ocean currents that went from West Africa to Florida, and there are. Two, how long does it take something floating from West Africa to Florida to get from Africa to Florida? And could bottle gourds float in the ocean long enough to do so? Um, as I understand it, they did some experiments in Boston Harbor where they numbered a bunch of bottle gourds and then floated them in the harbor and then recorded how long it took each one to sink or to become contaminated with seawater, killing the seeds inside. And uh, the short answer is that yes, currents run from West Africa to Florida naturally, and bottle gourds uh, can float the length of time that it would take to get from Africa to Florida. So we can hypothesize that trees with bottle gourd vines in them fell into the ocean, perhaps during some kind of big storm. Uh, the gourds broke loose, they floated across, they landed on the beach in Florida, and the Indians picked them up and planted them. Uh, also an early domesticate that we find is peepo squash. And we think that this earliest peepo squash was native to the Southeast, um, but that later we had a second introduction of a different peepo squash from Mexico. But the earliest squash found is found at Middle Archaic and some early Archaic wet Florida sites. And uh, these squash would have had bitter flesh, uh, but very thick shells. So both of these two earliest domesticates predate the invention of ceramic vessels in North America. And instead of being eaten, they were used as containers. Um, today, we think of squash as something that you eat the flesh. Back then, this squash would have been uh, very bitter with cucurbitacins. Here's one of my favorite paintings from John White, um, drawn in 1585 from the coast of Virginia, and it shows an adult Indian woman holding a bottle gourd uh, that looks as though she's carrying water in it. Also fun to note is that the child next to her is holding an Elizabethan doll. Now this raises the issue, can, if, if you are a society as the Eastern and Southeastern uh, North American Indians were, without hard containers, can you not have soup? That is, can you boil water? more than once in any container. How could you do that? <clears throat> so does it, do you have to wait until you have ceramic or metal containers before you can have soup? What do you think? How could you boil water in a gourd or a squash? Well, experimental archeology span has shown that you can do it by using rocks. So if you pick up rocks using uh, sticks, hot rocks, you heat them up, drop them in the liquid, uh, it will transfer the heat to the liquid and the liquid will boil and you won't burn up your container. Um, and uh, in this particular squash, this is a peepo squash that I grew, a replica peepo squash, very thick shelled. This container, granted it's small, it boiled in less than a minute. And I think that's faster than you would have gotten on a stove. This results in a lot of what archaeologists call FCR, meaning fire cracked rock. So at these pre ceramic archaic sites, fire, piles of fire cracked rock tell you where people were boiling. By the late archaic, we see a number of other domesticated and or cultivated crops, both sunflower and sumpweed, both oily seeds. Sunflower, of course, you know about. Sumpweed has a seed very similar to sunflower, uh, but sumpweed is now uh, extinct as a domesticate. All we have left today is the weedy seeds from this crop. Little barley appears to have been domesticated, 
and maygrass was at least cultivated, if not domesticated. This chart shows you uh, one of the areas with the most paleoethnobotany done and um, showing uh, uh, through time from different sites the sizes of the sumpweed seeds. And um, ethnobotanists have decided that the red line there near four millimeters in length indicates uh, that collections that are mostly above that in size were domesticated and those that are mostly below it in size are weeds. And of course, domesticated crops often have weeds in them, so you'll see some crossing over of the line. But this indicates to you how in trying to determine domestication of a crop, you need to have a sequence uh, through time showing changes, morphological changes that would indicate genetic changes. By the late archaic, Kenopodium, called Kenopod, was domesticated. And we can tell this from the difference in the domesticated seeds, which have thin seed coats, from the weedy seeds, which have thick seed coats. Um, not just the seeds of Kenopodium are edible, and, um, and although our Kenopod, domesticated Kenopod from Eastern North America is now extinct, um, this crop was also domesticated in Central America and South America and has continued up into the current time. So when you go to the health food store and buy quinoa, you are buying domesticated quinopod. And our crop, our seeds, would have looked very similar to those seeds. So in other words, thin seed coats might have a white seed and thick seed coats might have black seeds. Uh, so uh, much of the domesticated quinopod or quinoa has white seeds. And um, if you look at the weedy seeds from the local kinopods growing around your house and in barnyards, uh, you'll find black seeds. But the leaves are also very highly nutritious, very high in vitamin A, even late in the summer. We see the first maize during the Middle Woodland period. And maize is a crop that originated in Mexico. It came up into the Southwest and from there into the Eastern United States. However, um, as I'll talk about a bit later, even though we find maize in the Middle Woodland period, it seems to be mostly a, an item of curiosity in shamans bundles, and it is not yet in uh, a common element in people's diet. People instead are relying on these other crops that I've talked about up until now. In the Middle Woodland, we also see the earliest tobacco. Now, of course, people aren't eating tobacco, but I had to show off these beautiful seeds. They're the size of a period at the end of a sentence. But at about 70 power and higher, you can see the beautiful seed coat design that um, makes this seed so distinctive under the microscope. But tobacco um, is a, an, a hallucinogenic crop, uh, very important uh, for people. Originally, it was not smoked for recreation, but for ritual purposes. But we see that also first appearing in the mid-continent around the St. Louis area um, during the Middle Woodland. And it's not until about AD 800 that we see the common bean, also a crop that came to us from Mexico via the Southwest. And it's also at this time period that maize begins to become an, uh, an, a more important item of of, in the diet. So if in the third grade or at a younger age here in America, you learned about the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash, I'll call corn maize a more appropriate term for it. Um, in reality, these did not travel together. Uh, we first saw squash as early as 3,500 BC, and that squash itself was not edible, although you could eat the seeds. They would have been, um, have a little bit of protein in them. Um, we don't see uh, maize until Middle Woodland, but it's not actually in the diet until about AD 800. And we don't see beans until about AD 800. So it took thousands of years for these three sisters to get together. And during those thousands of years, Eastern North American Indians were depending upon other types of crops that you've never heard about. Now, how do we know that maize was not uh, in the diet or was not important in the diet in the Middle Woodland period? Well, we can tell because of the photosynthetic pathways that plants take to convert sunlight into carbon. 
we have three heavy carbon isotopes, C12, C13, and C14. And during life, organisms on Earth take in these C isotopes, these carbon isotopes. Um, and the carbon isotopes, of course, are produced only by plants. After death, you no longer take any carbon isotopes into your body. Now, because of the different photosynthetic pathways of plants, and we know of at least three major types of pathways, the C3, the C4, and the CAM pathway, um, the carbon that the plants produce uh, differs in the isotopic ratio. So some produce more C12, some produce more C13, some produce C14. And whatever uh, ratio of those isotopes you take in in your food is chemically converted and shows up inside all of your body tissues. So you literally are what you eat. Tropical origin plants, such as maize, follow the C4 pathway, which results in ingesting more carbon-13 isotopes. Whereas temperate origin plants tend to follow the carbon-3 um, uh, carbon pathway resulting in more carbon-12, or the C3 pathway, resulting in more carbon-12 isotopes. Now, of the three heavy carbon isotopes, C14 is unstable with a half-life of 5,730 years. In other words, if you took in 100 grams of carbon-14 during your lifetime, 5,730 years after you died, half of that would have changed uh, uh, and gone away. It would have changed. Whereas C, uh, carbon-12 and carbon-13 are stable isotopes, and so whatever ratio of those that you take in during your lifetime remain in your body, in your tissues, in your bones after death, and those can be used to reconstruct the diet. Were you eating um, tropical origin plants? Were you eating temperate origin plants? So we can look at the human bone to see whether uh, what ratio of carbon isotopes people were taking in. And for inland eastern North America, where the vast majority of plants common in the diet followed the C3 pathway, we can see when people started eating plants like maize that followed the C4 pathway because the ratio of uh, carbon-12 to carbon-13 changes. Additionally, we look at the paleoethnobotanical plant remains themselves to see what sorts of plant remains that we see that they are eating. What were people eating prior to the importance of maize rising in the diet? They were eating the eastern agricultural complex, that is, plants that were native to eastern North America. And these included what archaeologists classify as starchy seeds and oily seeds. The starchy seeds, including quinopod, maygrass, and little barley, provided carbohydrates in the diet. And the oily seeds, including sunflower and sumpweed, provided a lot more protein and flavor in the diet. So people were depending for thousands of years upon crops that were not maize, crops that you have probably until now never heard about, but that were very important to people. Other starchy seeds were used in uh, specific regions. So in the Midwest, we find also people eating erect smartweed. One thing I would like to point out briefly is that the original or early uses of plants may have been quite different from how we use them today. So today when you think of squash, you think of eating the flesh and only children eat the seeds at Halloween. Whereas when it first um, was being used in the eastern United States, it was used as a container. The flesh was very bitter. And if you ate anything, you ate the seeds or you ate the male flowers, which can be dried um, and folded up and then added to soups later. I'll end this short presentation with pictures of one of the many different types of Indian gardens that I have helped to recreate. And this was the uh, first one uh, facilitated by Anthony Kennard um, in Dayton, Ohio, at what is now Sunwatch Village. Um, a reconstructed Fort Ancient town that you can visit.